Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to sit and hear from you, Lord. We pray that you will speak to your church this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Prepare our hearts to receive and to believe. Give our minds and our ears understanding. Lord, I just ask that you would use me to speak your words and yours alone, God. In Jesus' name, we ask for clarity of the word that we may be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, family. Are y'all ready to hear from the word of God this morning? This is why we are here to hear from the Lord. So if you would, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as we continue in 2 Corinthians. I did miss you guys last week. I was at my pastor's church in St. Louis. They had their six-year anniversary and they asked me to come and speak for them and so I did that. Now would you guys stand with me as we read God's word? This is just us saying that this is not a standard book that we are reading from, that we believe this is the 2 Timothy 3.16 God-breathed word that we are reading. So let's read it, starting at verse 1, chapter 5. It says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Amen. Today I would like to talk to you all from the title, Courageously Living with the reality of eternity, courageously living this life with the reality of eternity. The main point of the text today is that even as we look forward to the future, we look to the past at what he has done, he being Jesus, and we live courageously and faithful in the present. Said another way, this text today describes the tension of living in this present life with all of its struggles, but even in the midst of doing that, we both look forward to a future in heaven, and we also look back at what Jesus has done and God's sovereign plan that empowers us to continue to live until that day. 
Hopefully that makes sense. If not, it will make more sense. So we're going to start with the first few verses. And the first few verses are going to really kind of be looking forward to the future and how it affects our present. So the first few verses, it says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. Now what's happening here is this word tent is being used to describe our body and our life here on earth. And so we see a comparison between this tent, which is transitory, it is temporary, it is not meant to be lived in every day, and that's com- and is made with human hands, the Bible says, is our body. But what it's comparing it to is the building that we will have in eternity. The building, something that lasts forever. What it's getting at is that this life is temporary. It is almost like a blip. But the thing about this life is that the way this life is lived and what we believe and who we follow, I pray that we're following Jesus and believing in Jesus, that is going to determine what reality, what the building of eternity will be like for us. So he describes it as temporary versus the eternal the human experience versus what we are going to get from God, our godly eternity, this eternal body that we're going to have. And so what begins, the question that begins to be asked is, which one of these realities gets the most focus for us? Is it the reality of these 70, 80 possibly 90 years that we live here? Or do we give more focus to eternity? Matthew 6, Jesus gives his take on this. On Matthew 6, in verse 19, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't let your treasures, don't live for only what's happening here on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? We we lay up treasures in heaven by focusing on those things that are eternal and that point us towards the eternal. We're not looking at it in our text today, but uh, verse 10 of our text today talks about how one day we will be in the judgment seat of Christ and we will receive the rewards for what we lived here on earth, both good and bad. So what we do here on earth determines our rewards in heaven. This is how we lay up our treasures in heaven. First Timothy 4 talks about this phenomenon too. You know, earlier in the office we met before we came out today and Mike, I'm telling you a business. Mike said that he was working out more now. He said he was on the elliptical machine. He said he was working on this temporary tent that we got going on. This is what Timothy says about that. For while bodily training is of some value, that's good, but godliness is of a value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. Yes, it's good to be working on our bodies, but guess what is more important? Are we working on our souls? Are we working on godliness? Let 
The thing about it is it says if we're working on godliness, it also holds promise of this present life. Why is that? It's because godliness is the way that God intended us to live. If you are pursuing godliness with your life, then that means you are on the road and you are living the life that God called for you to live. Later on, we're going to talk about some of the groanings and the burdens of this life. And the truth of the matter is, is that some of the groanings and the burdens that we have is because we haven't been pursuing godliness. Is that an amen or no? The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have set hope, we have our hope set on the living God. We toil, we strive towards godliness. What does that mean? We don't live our life aimlessly. We are investing in eternity. Some of you all know the Lord blessed me and my wife with our first house last year around this time. And since then, we have been doing things like measuring and looking on Pinterest and designing rooms If y'all come to our guest bathroom, it's very interesting. There's wallpaper there that's green and blue that was ordered from Amazon and installed by my lovely wife. Right now, we are working on my den, and there's a lot of pieces that we have to get for my den. That's my room that I get to hang out in. She's got her little room. That's, That's all right. The boys got their room, but I got my den. Here's the thing, I wouldn't be planning and measuring and researching how I would want to design a hotel room, because I'm not staying in that hotel room forever. I am in there for one or two days. So this scripture is calling us to consider our life like that hotel room. Just like I wouldn't spend my time planning on how I'm going to decorate a hotel room that I'm going to be in for one or two days. Instead, I'm going to spend time doing that for my residence that I'm going to live in forever. That's the same way the scripture is calling for us to think about our lives, not 99% about what we're doing now in this world and 1% on eternity. Instead, our focus should be on eternity. The text is going to help us here in a little bit and figure out how we live in our present life um, with a focus on eternity. This idea is very important because for some of us, future may not be that far. Any one of us can cease from living in this tent at any moment. And at that moment, now we're talking about eternity. It makes it not seem like a future distant thing so much now, does it? So again, Timothy told us we are training in our godliness more than just the things of this life. The other reason why this is important is because verses 2 and verses and verse 4 describe that we are in this tent groaning. It says that we are groaning And we are longing and we are burdened. It's important that we understand the reality of eternity because we understand that this groaning that we have to deal with is in fact temporary. 
these life situations that are so hard, these circumstances that are so hard, these diagnoses that are so heart-wrenching, these scenarios in our life that are so unpleasant are in fact temporary. We are groaning. We are burdened. Everyone groans. But verse 2 says, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. The thing about this groaning is that everybody, believer or unbeliever, deals with this groaning. But guess what? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus, you can also long. What are you longing for? You're longing for that future hope. It's not hopeless for us. We can long because we understand that one day all of this will be over. So that begs the question, are we longing? Are we longing for God? Are we longing for that future hope? Do we believe it when Jesus said that I have gone to prepare a place for you and that I will come back and receive you to myself? A couple of years ago, the women did the IF conference in um, it might have been last IF conference. I'm not sure. You guys can let me know. But Dianya was telling me about some of the things that were impactful for her. And uh, she played me a clip from Francis Chan where he talked about the lullaby of life. Was that this year? Last year? And the, the, what the lullaby was about was that we can just kind of get caught up in just the whole hum of this life. If you got kids, you probably are thinking about scheduling and activities and school. If you don't have kids, you're thinking about your work possibly or your retirement. Every, everybody got some things in their life. They have things that make up the building blocks of their life. And we can get lulled into this lullaby of life where that consumes most of our thoughts and our attention. But the scripture tells us here in verse Four, while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we will be unclothed, but that we will be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up. Here's the key part, that it may be swallowed up by life. In other words, that lullaby of our daily existence is actually the lullaby of death. Not to be grim, but it's the lullaby of death in the sense that this is something that is not going to last forever. This is something whose importance is eventually going to be nil. So when it says that we, we long to be further clothed and to be swallowed up by life, it's speaking to the reality again that true life is the life that's going to be the eternal life. Now, we as believers, the scripture tells us in a couple more verses that we have been given a deposit of what will be our future glory. That deposit is in the person of the Holy Spirit. So while we are in this life today, it doesn't have to be marked by the lullaby of death, but it can be about life. Why? Because we live a life that points to the ultimate value of eternity. This is important to understand because we cannot be content with this life. In addition, again, verse 5 says, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. We also cannot be content with just this deposit. We must aspire and desire the fullness of God, which we will get one day. This is what our longing is about. 
So that is how we look towards the future. But also we look towards the past and how God worked in the past. That also affects our present. Let's look at verse 5. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. What does this important statement mean that he who has prepared us for this is God? It's God that who has prepared us for this life. It is God who has prepared us for eternity. It is God who has prepared our future home. It is God who has prepared us, most importantly, Jesus as the vehicle that we ride into glory. This phrase that it is God who has prepared us speaks to an attribute of God, which is his sovereignty. This idea of sovereignty is that God knows exactly what your life is about, what it would be about, and he is okay with that, and that if you are in Christ Jesus, then he is controlling that. He has prepared you for this life. It is, it is only because that is true that Romans is true that says all things work together for the good to those who love God who are called to his purpose. That statement is only true that all things work together for our good because God has prepared us for this life. I'm going to prove it to you in the text though. But God has prepared you for it. Even the groanings and the burdens of this life, God has prepared you for it. We're going to read a nice block of text here, so that's a warning for you. But it is a good text, and I'm, I'm going to try not to expound on it. I'm going to try to just let the word speak for itself. But what we are getting at here, as we turn to Ephesians 1, is we are getting at this fact that God has prepared us for this life. At its, in its deepest sense, God has prepared us for it. He has pre prepared it before we were even born. And that includes the most precious part of this life for us, which is our salvation. Let's start at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us, that's past tense, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons, I would add, and daughters through Jesus Christ. Why? According to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, 
as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that by who, so that we who were the, the first to hope in Christ might be to his praise and glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. What do we get out of that? How is that him preparing us for this life? We see, first of all, that he was thinking about your life in particular way back before you were even born. Not only was he thinking about that, but he was thinking about how he was going to make you his son and daughter way before you were born. Not only that, he was thinking about how he would give you this great salvation by sending Jesus to pay for the things you can't afford, namely the sins that you commit. He was thinking about how he would send his son Jesus to take your place in death and in receiving his wrath so that you might believe in him and follow him and now reclaim, or not reclaim, but now have um, a standing with God that is right and that is close. And he also planned that he would give you his spirit as a guarantee for your future glory. Yes, thank you, Lord. He has prepared you for this life. God has prepared us for the groaning and the longing in his sovereign plan. We can take comfort in that. We can take comfort, and this is hard, but we can take comfort in it. Even God knew about that cancer. God knew about the child that has autism. God knew about the season of financial desperation. God knew about the mental illness. God has prepared you for this, and the scripture says his grace is sufficient for this. What he did in the past, it also said in that Ephesians that he has given us every spiritual blessing. What is that spiritual blessing and that spiritual grace for? It is to prepare us to deal with this life, to run this race successfully in Christ Jesus. Let's go back to verse 5 in our text. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. God has prepared us by His Spirit. He's prepared us by His Holy Spirit who empowers, who emboldens, who extends grace, who leads us, who guides us, who comforts us, who holds us. This is how he has prepared us. This is why John 14 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you in the form of the Holy Spirit in your hearts. We must take comfort in the sovereign plan of God, the life-given sacrifice of Jesus, and the life of the empowering gift of the Holy Spirit. We have to take comfort in that as we deal with the groanings and the burdens of this life. How does this connect with our present? Let's look at verse 6. So we understand what God is going to do with us. We understand what God did do with us. Now, how are we supposed to live in light of all of that? 
Verse 6, so we are always of good courage. Mm. Anybody ever felt like just being discouraged? But the scripture says we are to always be of good courage. This is the kind of thing that we have to preach to ourselves when we want to have a pity party. When we want to just... <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You, you, you can cry. But we aren't to just stay there. We aren't to just put on our sweatpants and our pajamas and lay in our bed for days at a time, discouraged. We are always of good courage. Why? Because of what we just read, because he's prepared us for this. You are built for this. So we are courageous when things don't go our way. We are courageous when we have a crazy conflict that we have to deal with. We are courageous when anxiety and depression want to come upon our mind like a 500-pound Acme anchor. You wouldn't understand that, Audrey. I'm sorry. Neither would you, Bree or Chloe. What does this courage look like? It's not this bravado. It's not necessarily this super strong person that we look at and say they have it all together. You can be courageous and look broken. Why? Because courage is to, verse 7, walk by faith and not by sight. Courage is to walk by faith in what God's Word says and what we're learning today, even when our sight says, God, this is crazy. Faith is what let Peter walk on water when he should have drowned. Faith is what let Abraham and Sarah, and I'm going to say especially Sarah, carry a baby at 100 years old. This faith is what let the three Hebrew boys walk into that fire. Faith is what pleases God. So what is it to be courageous? It is to walk by faith. This is verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. This is what it means to be courageous. That what we see is not more real than what we don't see. How else are we supposed to live? Verse 9. This is the key part. This is what ties all of this together. Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. This is what I meant when I said it'll make sense how we can live for eternity. It's not a conceptual thing. That's far off and we can't do, it says we make it our aim to please him. That affects our every day, doesn't it? I got a family. How do I please him with my family? I got a job. How do I please him with my job? I've got a spouse. How do I please him and my spouse? I've got a church. How do I please him and how I serve the church? I've got money. How do I please him in stewarding my money? We make it our aim to please him. So I must ask another question. Are we aiming to please the Lord with our lives? 
Is that our life's aim? What does it mean to aim? It means to focus something. What are you most focused on? The beauty of this, honestly, is that the Bible says if you seek first the kingdom in heaven and his righteousness, what happens? All the other things will be added to you. So it's not that God is saying, I want to take away these other things, but he's saying, I want it to be your aim to please me and do it in those other things. Are we aiming to please the Lord? Do we, like Philippians 3 and 8, count everything else as dung compared to the surpassing glory of Jesus Christ? How do we please him? What does the Lord want from us? I would say, number one, he wants our heart. He wants you fully. He wants our obedience. He wants our time. He wants to be our treasure. He wants our mouth. What does that mean? He wants our mouth to spend time praying to him. He wants our mouth to spend time praising him. He wants our mouth to spend time talking about him. In short, he wants all of you, flaws and all. So how will you please the Lord this week? How will you make it your aim to please the Lord this week? I want to end by hopefully stirring up the joy of your salvation with two parables that Jesus gave concerning how we ought to view and treasure this great salvation, which is a free gift of God. The salvation that we get by repenting of our sins believing on Christ and following him. But I want to encourage us with these two parables because I want to make sure that we, we frame our salvation in the right place. Let's go to Matthew 14, excuse me, Matthew 13, 44 and 45. I'm going to read the screen. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. This is how we should look at our salvation in Jesus Christ. Treasure, joy, giving up everything for it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Next verse, please. Oh, we lost it. Let me just read it again. Verse 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Notice in this parable, the merchant was looking for fine pearls. For us, we seek to enjoy our life. We look for fine pearls in life. We look for those things that make us happy. But the kingdom of God is that one pearl of great value. That thing in our life that surpasses 
everything else. That is what our salvation is. We need to, I wanted to frame that for us so that if that is not what we look at our salvation as, it's something that we can pray to say, God, would you give me a desire for you like that? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I just pray that this word will have stirred up the spirit of God in my brothers and sisters in Christ that we would want to make it our aim to please you. God, that we would also long for eternity with you. God, that we would also understand that regardless of the burdens of this life that you have in fact prepared us for it and that your grace is sufficient for us despite how hard it is. I pray that we would be encouraged to be courageous and of good courage at all times, Lord, because you are with us. Lord, forgive us when this is not the case in our life. Forgive us when we don't look at our salvation as the pearl of great price or a treasure that surpasses everything else. We pray that that would be the case, Lord. And for some, we pray, God, that you would just help our unbelief. Keep us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you stand?